Good evening and welcome to tonight's lecture, Leadership Redefined, Crafting Civic Virtues in America. My name is Claire Barnett and I'm a second year undergraduate student majoring in Human and Organizational Development, class of 2019. Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Zern and I'm also a second year um, undergraduate student majoring in HOD, class of 2020. Claire and I are here to introduce our distinguished speakers who will offer reflections upon the virtues of leadership and the civic patterns that affect American life. Towards the conclusion of tonight's dis discussion, Chancellor Zeppos will randomly select questions submitted by the audience before the event and on Twitter during the panel. First to be introduced tonight is John Meacham. John Meacham is a distinguished visiting professor of political science at Vanderbilt and a renowned presidential historian. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and his newest book, Our Better Angels, The Struggle for the American Soul, is set to release this fall. Please join me in welcoming John Meacham. Cousins. Yeah. Yeah. Our special guest tonight is Carly Fiorina. Ms. Fiorina is the founder and chairman of the Unlocking Potential Foundation. She's a seasoned problem solver who passionately advocates for entrepreneurship, innovation, and effective leadership. Carly started out as a secretary for a small real estate business and eventually became the first woman ever to lead a Fortune 50 company when she was recruited to lead Hewlett Packard in 1999. After leaving HP, Carly focused her efforts on giving back. Prior to announcing her candidacy for president for the Republican nomination in 2015, she served as the chairman of several organizations, including Good 360 and Opportunity International. Please join me in welcoming Carly Fiorina to the stage. Finally, our conversation will be facilitated tonight by Chancellor Nicholas S. Zeppos. <laughs> Chancellor Zeppos is the university's eighth chancellor and he has served in this role since 2008. In addition to leading our university, he is both a highly respected professor and legal scholar. He began his time at Vanderbilt in 1987 as assi an assistant professor in the law school. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Chancellor Zeppos to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Carly, it's great to have you here at Vanderbilt. I'll give John the first question, and he may want to pour the martinis. Uh, yeah, I don't this know is who great. John is. That's a pretty large Well, you picture. are a Republican, so <laughs> we brought that part for you. Oh, wow. Oh, look, right <laughs> out of the starting gate. starting out there. Right That's out of the gate. Thing. Right out of the gate. That's a may, good may thing. May I just say, before we get into the questions, these two young ladies who just graciously introduced us, Sam and Claire, they interviewed me uh, prior to this. And if we had more reporters who asked the thoughtful questions that these two young ladies did, our civil discourse would be elevated dramatically. Yeah. So here, here. Yeah. Thank you. So we were gonna hire 15 other white guys to come up on stage so you would feel at home. Uh, <laughs> Tell so, us, let's see, we just started us. here. <laughs> now, I didn't tell you about his act, Carly. It's, just, it's usually like 10 minutes and then we... No, no. So what was that like? You were, you were in the arena. Uh, what, was your, what did you consider your, what you would think of as the best moment of running for president? And what do you think the worst was? Well, first I should say, people have asked me a lot, what was it like being on a stage with 15 guys? Um, honestly, it was sort of the story of my life. I've spent most of my life with mostly men and competing with mostly men. Uh, the technology and the communications industries were and still are very male oriented. So for, actually for me, being with 15 guys was no big deal, but I think it was a big deal for some of them. Uh -huh. I think it was an unexpected experience for some of them. Any names um, come to mind at all? <laughs> um, honestly, the best moments were talking with American citizens in their dining rooms or their living rooms or in a community somewhere. And I was asked once by a reporter, what was the biggest surprise about running for president? And my answer was, and it's one of the reasons I mentioned uh, Sam and Claire, 
My answer was my biggest surprise was the difference between the quality of the questions and the quality of the conversation that I would have with American citizens and the questions you would get asked by journalists of all stripes. Yeah. Um, I think citizens engage in far more thoughtful and civil discourse than we do on television or certainly on that debate stage. Mm. And worst moment? Oh, or most worse. dispiriting, maybe? You know, I think, I wouldn't call it a moment. I would call it a recognition, a realization. I ran for president because I think ours was intended to be a citizen government, because I think we weren't intended to have professional politicians, and I think people who understand big bureaucracies um, would be helpful in Washington, because it's turned into a big bureaucracy under both parties. I think my... Um, most disappointing realization was when I came to see that politics actually has become all about winning. It's not about problem solving. Hmm. And George Washington actually warned us about this. George Washington said in his farewell speech, the problem with political parties is they will come to care only about winning. And they won't care about values, and they won't care about governing, and they won't care about problem solving. And honestly, I think we're there because and I'm, that's not a partisan comment. I, I think politics has been about, has become about winning, winning and winning. And so our political discourse feels like worldwide wrestling. You know, your team versus my team, it's a little anybody unfair on to my team's good, <laughs> and anybody on your team's bad, and you know, that's not civil discourse, and it's not citizenship, and it's not problem solving. You were the first uh, major party candidate, I think, since President Reagan to use the phrase citizen politician uh, in a fairly consistent and, and intelligent way. What was your intellectual journey toward that realization? Was this based on reading? Was this based on your experience in the private sector? Was this a terrific history teacher? Did you get this from your parents? Uh, it's a particular insight into the nature of the republic. And I'm just wondering what the origins of it for you are. Well, um, first I would say that I did not start out as a politically active person. In fact, I didn't vote for many years. My political philosophy has been formed by living life. And then, after living life for a while and discovering some things, then I got interested in the history of it. So for example, not to make this too long, but I learned in the course of going to work and living life that people closest to the problem know best how to solve it, that everybody has more potential than they realize, particularly each of us have the potential to lead. And I also learned that if you concentrate power for too long in too few hands, which is what happens in bureaucracies, that power gets abused. So I learned those things and then I, had a different sense in looking at our history. And when we look at the foundation of this country, we are the only country in the world and in history founded on two very fundamental principles. The first is that citizens are sovereign. Not government, not presidents, not kings, not politicians, citizens are sovereign. And that power concentrated is power abused. And so, so much of our founding documents are about how to elevate a sovereign citizen and how to prevent the concentration and therefore the abuse of power. And that turns out to be a conservative philosophy. What, uh, as you think about the dysfunction and the inability to solve problems and talk about citizen governance, what is the disconnect between such low approval ratings of our politicians institutionally and not more churn and turnover and change in the governance of America? Obviously, we, we see big shifts in the president, unexpected results perhaps that change policy, but why do we see such low ratings and yet it seems not to really change. That TV show would be canceled. <laughs> well, I think two things. I think the reason people are so 
distressed by politics, so frustrated, so angry, and that comes out in all kinds of things, including low approval ratings, yeah. um, is because I think so many citizens, myself included for a long time, so many citizens assume, oh, politicians are there to represent us and to solve problems. And I think what's happened over time is politicians are there to win. And that's not the same as solving problems. In fact, this, the sad but true fact is that frequently to win, it's better not to solve the problem. It's better to keep people stoked up so they're raising money and coming out. Unfortunately, anger gets a lot of people out to vote. So, so I think it starts there, the disconnect and the frustration. I come back to what I said a couple moments ago. I think political parties have tremendous power over how politics works. So let me just give you a very simple example. Um, <clears throat> Republican debate, primary, Democrat debate, and primary. There was a primary process in both parties. You may remember, if you were paying any attention to that, that there was discussion in both parties about how people got to the debate stage. It turned out that both the Democrats and the Republicans decided that the way to get to the debate stage, the way to stay on the debate stage, the placement on the debate stage, how long you got to talk on the debate stage, was determined from the very first debate by national polls. The media went along with this because they don't really want primaries. The attention span isn't that great for them. They wanted a general election. People watch those better. Why national polls? Actually, national polls are irrelevant to a presidential campaign. We don't have national elections. We have statewide elections. We have an electoral college. And as we found out, national polls frequently don't tell you what's going to happen. And yet, national polls were the metric. What do national polls measure? Name ID, familiarity, fame. And that's all about parties wanting to get a primary over with. I remember having a conversation with Governor Martin O'Malley. You, remember, you may remember he was in the Democratic primary. And at the very first debate, it was a three-hour debate, he was told, Governor O'Malley, welcome. You have four minutes and 30 seconds to speak. He said, what do you mean it's a several-hour debate? No, you have four minutes and 30 seconds because that's where he was in the national polls. You may wonder why the media ignored Bernie Sanders for such a long time. Because the parties wanted this thing over with. They wanted to get into a general election. And they thought name ID was a pretty good indicator of fundraising ability, how long you've been in politics, et cetera. Well, I didn't have to uh, go through any of the things you went through. But I also think, though, that there is a kind of campaign exhaustion part to our, let's have 20 primaries. Oh. So how do you reconcile, you know, it's, it's longer than any sports season you'd want to watch, and mm -hmm. I love college football. But how would you cut that short? Or, you know, on the one hand, you yeah, don't want to empower the parties, but on the other hand, it's like, God, this is just going on forever. And then you have to raise so much more money. Yeah. And if you don't raise the money, you know, you're out maybe yeah, much I, earlier than you ordinarily yeah, would be. I, look, I don't, I would be foolish to sit here and say, I have the answer. I have the silver bullet on fixing yeah. our political process. I don't. I think there's several things that would help. I think it would help uh, if we had term limits. I think it would help. <laughs> I think it would help if we had campaign finance reform as long as it treated everybody equally. Right. And most uh, proposed solutions don't treat everybody equally, so that gets to be a problem. But the thing that I think would help more than anything else is if more citizens paid attention and more citizens ran for office. Did the, um, I mean, and there's a lot of debate about this. and. Uh, did the money that you had to raise or the money you saw sloshing through trouble you as a corrupting influence on elections? Yes. Um, 
you need to spend an enormous amount of time raising money. And we raised more money than anyone thought we could, and we went further than, I mean, we outlasted governors and senators and all the rest. But the process, I'll tell you the, the to me the most corrupting part of raising money, and I'm using the term slightly differently perhaps than you are, is to raise money, you basically always have to talk to people who already like and agree with you. So what does that mean? It means you spend an enormous amount of time in a bubble with people telling you, yeah, 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 we like you. Well, that may not necessarily be what you need to hear if you're trying to solve a problem. It may not necessarily be time well spent if you're trying to bring a nation together. It may not necessarily be the way to find common ground. If what you're doing is spending so much time with people who just know you're right and agree with you totally, and more than that, agree with each other. The problem is, I think, honestly, I compare politics to sports so often because it feels like that's how it's become. When we get emotional about a sports team, our sports team can do no wrong. Um, I said I think an answer would be that citizens are more engaged, but I also think, I'll use an old-fashioned word here, I also think it would be helpful if we would all remember that old-fashioned things like character count, and that values matter, and that maybe it's less important whose team somebody plays on, and more important what their character is, and what their values are, and whether they bring people together or tear people apart. I actually think that matters a lot. I totally agree, and I suspect most of us do. So explain to me how the 45th president's the 45th president. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a clever way, but it's honestly, there's a, there's a question of is, have we gotten the president we actually deserve even though we don't want to admit it? Well, look, I, I, I'm not sure I have the, perfect answer here, but here's what I think happened. And I say this based upon conversations I've had with people all over the country in all kinds of circumstances. So first, I think there are partisan Democrats and partisan Republicans. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a pejorative. But partisan Democrats and partisan Republicans, once the primary is over, they're going to stand by their team. They may have misgivings, they may have reservations, but fundamentally they're going to stand with their team. And they're going to say, okay, maybe my gal or my guy isn't perfect, but they're better than the other guy or gal. And they may have very principled policy reasons for stating that. And so as we know, elections are now won or lost with people who aren't partisan Democrats or Republicans. They're in the middle maybe somehow. And I think what happened is you had a whole set of people who said, you know what? All politicians are corrupt. By the way, that's what most people think. Gallup has been asking a question, the same set of questions for decades now, and roughly 70% of the American people believe that politicians are corrupt, that they're out for themselves, they're not there for the people. So if you believe that, then you say, hey, they're all corrupt. Mm -hmm. They're all in it for themselves. So. I don't have a choice about character. Maybe I'm going to choose on policies. Or maybe I'm going to say, you know what? I'm sick of Washington. It hasn't worked for me. It hasn't solved problems. So I'm just going to give the new guy a chance because she's been around Washington forever. Yeah. I think this election was a result of a lot of frustration that the political system isn't working very well for most people. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think it remains not working for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, to go back to what you were saying a moment ago, uh, you come from a business that was embodied disruption, yeah. right? Um, you've talked about the stranglehold of the parties and, and, and the role of money. In that same polling, it is remarkable that the number of the proportion of millennials who do not affiliate with churches, traditional religions, political parties is extraordinarily high. Do you think there's a, if you were analyzing this as a, as a case study, does that disenchantment 
plus the what I would think of as we're in a political moment, which is kind of a political embodiment of climate change. It's 75 degrees one day, it's 30 degrees the next. It's just a, a wild moment. Out of that, do you see the parties in some ways perhaps reconstituting themselves in the next foreseeable future? Are there elements of the parties that may end up like the Democrats and the Republicans who changed over in the 60s? Uh, is there something that may shift all this up. There's the fantasy of the third party, the Bloomberg fantasy, largely perpetuated by Bloomberg. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but if you take the third party out of it, just think of it as we have to have two because the Electoral College, do you think that there's a, a new cocktail on the horizon? Well, let me start with the first part of your question. I think one of the reasons that millennials perhaps are less inclined to associate with institutions, some of which you mentioned, is because those institutions have been found wanting. Um, one of the things that technology does, there's a lot good about technology, there's a lot bad about technology, but one of the things that technology does over time is it strips away all illusion because you can't hide anything forever in this age of technology. It's all going to come out eventually. That should terrify anyone who has something to hide. I'm terrified right now. The good news is. The and good, Zeppos is, he's really sweating. So. For, both, for both of us. The, the good news is, I guess, that. Um, Transparency is always, over time, a disinfectant. I believe that. The bad news is that when things come out, it's easy to get disillusioned. And so say, oh my gosh, um, not every priest is a moral person, for example. Or this leader that I thought was so terrific, it turns out they have a lot of skeletons in their closet. And so I think it's easy to get disillusioned. One of the things that I spend a lot of time doing today, and I have tried to do all my life, and certainly was trying to convey in my presidential campaign, is that I think one of the first things that we as human beings, but in particular as sovereign citizens of this nation, need to decide is we're going to quit throwing our problems to someone else and hoping they're going to solve them. That while there are big, huge problems, there are also, we're all confronted with problems right in our backyards all the time. And actually, each of us can make a difference in those things. So I don't know whether the parties will reconstitute themselves. But what I do know is that if people are, people may be unhappy with the president, but and for lots of reasons, I mean, we can enumerate them. On the other hand, local politics is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And so if people are frustrated with politics, maybe encourage somebody you know to run for the school board, or maybe run for school board yourself, or maybe help lift up a local candidate. The only way you actually change something is from the bottom up and from the inside out. Leaders can be a catalyst to that change. But ultimately, if we want to change the political parties, it's not going to happen in Washington, D.C. They got a lock on that process right now. It's going to happen in our communities, and in our neighborhoods, and in our localities, and our states. What, uh, what do you think, of, if you're kind of sitting around giving free advice, what are the three major problems that you think we're not tackling as a nation? And what, what should be at the top of our to-do list? And I'm not saying the solution comes from Washington, Carly. But just what are those three things that should keep us all up at night that we should be working on to solve? Boy, you guys ask easy questions, don't you? Yeah. Um, so let me go back all the way to the beginning. And I was talking about these fundamental ideas upon which our nation was founded. One of the most important, if not the most important in my opinion, and the most unique for sure, was the idea, is the idea, that in this nation, we are not defined by our circumstances. 
that our future is not dictated by our past. It's not dictated by our parentage. It's not dictated by what our dad or our mom did. It's not dictated by our last name. It's not dictated by what we look like. And it's not dictated by how we started. Now, we've had to work really, really hard over hundreds of years to make sure that that idea applies to everyone. We, as a nation, I think, should be dedicating ourselves to make sure that that idea actually does apply to everyone. We, we've, we've come a long way in saying that we need to respect everyone, but we haven't solved the problem of circumstance. In this country still, your future is so much determined by your circumstances. The circumstances of your education, the circumstances of your living environment, the circumstances of your parents. In this world, we're not the biggest country in the world, for sure. But in this world, with all these huge problems we have, there is only one inexhaustible resource and it's called human potential. And if we apply human potential, we can solve every problem we have. The place that has always believed in the power of human potential is this country. So this should be the nation that says, here, we will lift every person up so that they can fulfill their potential. And we are a very, very long way from that. Now, you can unpack that many different ways. But I would go all the way back to the beginning and say, in this nation, unique in history and unique on the face of the planet, the citizen is sovereign. We are not defined by our circumstances. And so let us value each citizen, each individual, equally. And let us make sure that each of us has the opportunity to fulfill our potential. And that's not true today. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, if you look in health care, and I'm not starting a discussion about Obamacare or single payer, but this, probably the strongest determinant of your health is your socioeconomic status. Yes. Just and it's your education. Yeah, and it's your education then. And so does it require some stripping away or pulling us the curtain aside to say, let's be realistic about these are our aspirations, here's the reality. I mean, just saying some people can't get to the hospital or if there's a discharge, they don't have clean water, they don't have someone. And again, I'm not asking for the government to come in, but how does one talk to the country about lifting up our aspirations but being honest as you are about y these are the circumstances that people confront on a daily basis. So first, you're absolutely right. If you actually want to solve a problem, as opposed to talk about it, if you actually want to solve a problem, then you have to be extremely clear-eyed about what is the current state, what is the reality that we face today. And you also have to be very ambitious aspirational about the future state. And you said, let's not have the government come in and solve it. Here's something I've learned over and over and over and over again in my life. I've learned everybody has potential more than they realize. But I've also learned people closest to the problem know how to solve it. They don't always have the resources to solve it. They don't always have the opportunity to solve it. They don't always have the leadership to solve it. But they actually know what would make a difference. And so that's what I meant when I said, let's not keep throwing our problems to Washington. Look, I work with nonprofits every day that are working in communities every day incredibly hard, making a difference. Why do I invest in building leadership capacity in those nonprofit organizations? Because they actually know the problems in their communities. So yes, we can talk about global problems, and we can also talk about the problems right in our own backyard. The problem of poverty, of circumstances, of, of the inability of an individual to fulfill their potential is a local problem. It's here in Nashville. It's here on this university campus. You don't have to go to Washington, D.C. You don't have to go to India. You can start right here. 
And so I do think that part of, that's part of being a citizen too, actually, to participate in the problems that are right in front of us, because we all have them. Let me, let me uh, kind of pick up on this concept of leadership that you've demonstrated and written about and talked about and teach about. And I want to focus on an aspect of leadership that is often ignored but becomes central, and it's how does a leader grieve with a community and a nation? And how do you think of your experiences and your leadership style and approach and not being able to get up at the State of the Union and announce all these exciting things or, but really, you know, seeing young people shot at a school or hurricanes devastating. How do you grieve as a leader? So, leadership is not about the position you hold or the title you have. Leadership is defined by some very human characteristics, courage, character, the ability to see possibilities and circumstances, and particularly in the people around you. And an incredibly important quality of a real leader is humility and empathy. And the reason humility and empathy are so important is because without humility and empathy, you can't collaborate with other people. Particularly, you cannot collaborate with people who are different than you are. And if you're going to solve a problem, you always have to collaborate with people who have who are different than you are. So empathy is incredibly important. Humility is not false modesty. Humility is the willingness to know you don't know everything. And you can make a mistake, and you need help from other people. And empathy is the ability to actually see someone else and hear someone else and feel their circumstances. Without humility and empathy, uh, somebody is just reading a speech. And I think people can tell the difference between reading a speech and humility and empathy. On the story, you, you've thought a lot about restoring civic virtue and, and in, again, in manifesting those qualities not simply at the top, but, but uh, in total. How do we tell that story? How do, how do you teach it? How do, how do we actually encourage a climate that we all say we want, but which is obviously lacking? Well, I think one of the things that we all can do, that we each can do, is lift up people of virtue. And that sounds so obvious, but we actually don't do that very often. So think about social media. I mean, these kids here on the campus, young people on the campus, what, what does social media do? I mean, yes, everyone's going for likes, but what is it that frequently gets the likes? It's controversy, it's... Um, outrageous behavior sometimes, or it's something very superficial. And I've learned a long time ago that people who discourage and dislike are always more vocal than people who encourage and who like, right? It's always so much easier to criticize, so much easier to sit and say, well, they screwed it up, I don't like that. I that's so much easier. And so what happens is, how often do we say to, in a, in a community, how often do we say, you know, this is a person of virtue and character. They're not flashy. Maybe, in fact, they're the least flashy person around. But they're making a difference. They're solving a problem. They're exemplifying the courage and character and empathy of leadership. Let's lift them up. Let's encourage them. Let's like them. I don't think we reward virtue very often. And I don't think we lift up character very often. I think we tend to get caught up in the conflict and the controversy and the criticism. Sam Rayburn's great line was that 
takes a carpenter to build a barn and a jackass to kick it down. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, a lot of times the carpenter, if you think about that analogy, it's a great line, but think about it, the carpenter is kind of sawing away for a long time, and he's not getting a lot of attaboys, you know? He may be working hard alone a lot of the time. Nobody's saying, yeah, yeah, you go until it's all over, and then, wow, wasn't that cool? Right. Sometimes I think we underestimate, honestly, all of us as individuals, as human beings, as citizens, as members of the community, sometimes I think we underestimate the impact that each of us have, that a word or a, an encouraging word yeah. can have. Is there, a, <clears throat> is there an era, is there a moment that you think of as exemplary in American history or global history that if we could model that behavior, we would be in a better place? Oh, I think all eras have their problems. <laughs> and I think the past always looks somehow gauzier through the mists of memory. You know, I, hey, people are people. I was a history and philosophy major in college, so which is why I started out as a secretary. <laughs> and, I'm um, that. No, no, no. Jim, it's, what was your major? It's the no, best no, no. education. I, I was a history it'll, major. It'll serve yeah. you for the long Don't term. Don't say that. There's no, it'll serve you for the long sense. term. I, I have no regrets about history that degree. History rules. History will you. serve you John, in the long term, you? but it's tough in the Classics short term. Or? Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. Uh, well, I'm just Sawani, so we had to major in that. Um, the uh, English literature. English my, literature. My, my English point, literature, there you go. Literature. See, a humanist, a classicist. By the way, those things give you perspective. I think and, they're very uh, important. Wisdom. I do, too. I do, too. I advise I everyone think, uh, to take the, them. I think, wow, well, we're a little sensitive on this one. No, no. <laughs> I'm advertising. I'm selling. Yeah, I know. I'm I know. selling. My no, I... As a literature major, as a history major, as a history and philosophy major, the one thing you learn, perspective, in studying those things is people are people. You know, cultures change, values change, context changes, mores change, but technology changes for sure, but people are people. There are some fundamentals of human nature, and one of the fundamentals of human nature is that we are flawed characters, so every era is flawed, and this is, not necessarily the only era in human history in which there is unbelievable partisan vitriol. However, I do think it is an era in which, you know, when we, it's a dichotomy to me. When, when we are in our smart devices, we're the most powerful people in the world. You know, we can do anything, we can communicate with anybody, we can solve any problem, find out any piece of information. I mean, we're all powerful. And yet, somehow, we tend to settle back and forget our own power vis-a-vis -vis government and politics and problems. And so I think, honestly, as individuals, we are the most fortunate, historically speaking, this is an accurate statement despite all our problems in this country, we are the most fortunate, empowered, liberated, educated people on the planet and in the history of the earth. We have enormous power. And so I just wish we would use it more. I mean, you, um, not to go back to the history major, but you made the comment about um, starting out as a secretary which um, unfortunately is very gendered and very first. It certainly was then. Yeah, and I think of you and Sandra Day O'Connor as kind of like, well, I went to law school and now I'm a secretary. And so as you look at all the glass ceilings you've broken through and the role model you are and the only woman candidate on that stage, how do you think of breaking those barriers and the Me Too movement and the kind of um, recognition that you have worked in really, really, really tough environments and faced discrimination, undoubtedly? What is your reaction to this as you look over your career and starting out as a secretary like the first female justice. 
The difference is she finished law school. I quit after one <laughs> semester. So. Um, so One of the things, I'll start in a slightly different place than your question ended, but I will get to the end of your so you question. So you went to at least a semester of law school. Yeah. No, yeah. no, I, I quit after the first exam. It was a practical response. Um, <clears throat> I, young women ask me a lot, Why? you know, what advice would you have for me? And I say two things. Number one, don't get a chip on your shoulder. And what I mean by that is, I've experienced every bad thing. Mo I mean, I've never been assaulted or abused, but I have had, I've been groped. My first meeting with a client happened in a strip club because that's where my male colleagues went. I've been told I would get promoted faster if I would just sleep with the boss. You know, all of that stuff has happened to me. So it's easy to get a chip on your shoulder. The reason I say don't get a chip on your shoulder is for every bad actor I could name, I can name 10, 10 men who helped me, lifted me up. Two men who, for example, came to my desk when I was a secretary after six months and said, we've been watching you. You can do more than type and file. Let us show you what we do. And they saw possibilities in me, and that changed everything about how I saw myself. So don't get a chip on your shoulder. Because as bad as some of the guys out there are, there are more who are good and who can lift you up and go to the people who will lift you up. The second thing I say is be as good as you are. Be as smart as you are. Be as strong and brave as you are. And if somebody else has a problem with it, it's their problem, not your problem. And there are going to be people who have a problem with them. Don't let them decide who you're going to be. What is going on when someone is harassed, assaulted, abused? It is an abuse of power. That's what it is. It's using sex as a weapon, but it's an abuse of power. So when a priest abuses a young boy, that's an abuse of power, too. People sometimes abuse the power of physical strength. Sometimes they abuse the power of a position of trust. Sometimes they abuse the power of, I determine how big your paycheck is, and I determine whether you're going to get a raise. But nevertheless, it is all the same. It is all an abuse of power, and it's intolerable. And so we should always stand up. I wrote an op-ed about this. Women have been standing up and speaking out about this for a long time. And as much as we all hope that this will never happen again, if you go back into the 70s and the 80s, you will see doctor scandals that are just heartbreakingly familiar to the scandal about Larry Nassar in gymnastics only decades ago. It was a swim team and a coach with girl swimmers. So the point is, this does happen. Power gets abused. The thing that's going to change it, I think, really, it's not when women speak up. Back to characters and values. It's going to be when men say, I don't respect anymore a man who abuses his power. I'm not going to wink and nod and slap him and say, yeah, it's OK. It's not OK. It's a question of character. It's a question of values. A good man, and there are more good men than bad men, a good man never abuses his power. Amen. Very good. What is what makes you most excited about your nonprofit work at this point? You know what makes me excited is to see what's going on in these communities. So we just finished. Uh, I think leadership, the leadership curriculum that I built based on decades of experience, talks about the characteristics, the human characteristics of leadership, which are available to us all. Courage, character, humility, empathy, collaboration, seeing possibilities, particularly in other people. And then um, I've used over the years a couple of very simple but very powerful tools to help people achieve results. Because in the end, if you're not achieving results and actually making a problem better, then 
you know, you're just kidding yourself. So we've engaged in this kind of intensive experience and coaching with people like Easter Seals and Wounded Warriors and Doctors Without Borders, and you see people and communities doing incredible work. And so that's what gives me hope and optimism. We don't have to sit back and wait for some, yes, it would be great if we had leaders in politics in Washington. It would be wonderful. And leaders can make a difference. And leaders can bring a nation together instead of tearing it apart. But it's also true that we have leaders all around us in our communities. I see them every single day. They're making a difference. They're tackling very difficult problems. That's what excites me, is the people I meet every single day and in the incredible work that they're doing. About Washington, just briefly. Um, the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, of Reagan, um, Eisenhower, is in something of an identity crisis, I think even Republicans acknowledge that. I think even the, the partisan folks you mentioned. What do you do? How do you fix it? Well, you know, in a way, I think um, both parties are in identity crises. And maybe that's why you asked the question about do parties have to reconstitute mm -hmm. themselves? Yes, I think the Republican Party is in an identity crisis. I think the Democrat Party is in one too. I think there, you know, there are huge debates going on in the Democrat Party. Should we become more progressive, more Bernie Sanders-like, more big government programs? Should we really go back to talking with the working man and woman, the small business owner, et cetera? Republicans, to me, as an example of politics, make strange bedfellows. Wow. In the last year, uh, I've heard Democrats talking about debts and deficits and Republicans not so much. Funny how that works. What, what the heck, you know? Uh, I, I've, I've heard um, Democrats talking about, you know, abuses of constitutional power, Republicans not so much. I think um, both parties are a little mixed up. Let me go back to what I believe. And, and honestly, I don't know whether this is consistent with what the Republican Party believes anymore. I, I really don't know, and I don't say that in a pejorative way. No. Um, so first, people closest to the problem know best how to solve it. Power concentrated is power abused. So what does that say to me? That says to me that our goal should be to decentralize power, money, and problem solving out of Washington and into our states and our communities. Right. Uh, but as you know. Republicans, by the way, Republicans and Democrats alike have done the opposite. Sure. So Republicans have concentrated power. Sure. Democrats have concentrated power. Republicans and Democrats have concentrated money in Washington. Here's the other thing about Washington, bureaucracies. Bureaucracies, whether they're a big company like HP or a big government like Washington, D.C., bureaucracies are process-driven beasts that are focused on self-preservation and the enhancement of their own power. It is the nature of a bureaucracy. Let me get more power and let me preserve the power I have. So what happens when a bureaucracy has a lot of power is things get really complicated. Washington's really complicated. And guess who all that complexity benefits? Oh, it benefits the politicians, but it benefits big, powerful, wealthy, well-connected people. That's who it benefits, always. Why? Because if you have a complex system, you need accountants and lawyers. You need lobbyists. You need money. You need mm -hmm. access. And guess who has access? Money, accountants, lawyers, lobbyists, big companies, not small. Wealthy people, not middle class or poor people. Um, people of influence, not anonymous people. In other words, this big, complicated government that both Republicans and Democrats alike have contributed to building mm -hmm. is punishing everyone but the big, the wealthy, the well-connected. So I think we, our founders had it right. <laughs> yeah. We have to push money, power, decision-making 
problem solving out of Washington. Some things only Washington can do. Washington's job is, you know, the security of the nation, for example. It's why all the way back, it's why I'm not sure the Republican Party or the Democratic Party will ever resolve their identity crisis unless more citizens take the time to reflect and decide, what do I really believe? What are the principles by which I think we should govern ourselves? And then let me get involved as a citizen in solving problems locally and holding people accountable at all levels to satisfy my standards of principles and values, whatever those may be. That's I, true. The democratic debate, though, at least is a per perennial and familiar one. It's Bob Rubin versus Bernie Sanders. We've been having that debate in the Democratic Party forever. The party that no, we're having. I, I just want to challenge you for a second. I don't know. I don't know that 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you would have had an avowed socialist running as a serious presidential candidate in this country. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't think, think that's 20, relatively new. I don't think 20 months ago you had an avowed sexual groper as president of the United but, States. That wasn't a pejorative. I no, agree. No, no, not only that, but, but I think we're, we're, by in, the way, we're in a by wild way, No, 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 no. I agree. And by the way, just to be fair about this, I, look, I, I won't defend Donald Trump's behavior. Okay. But this, the thing, this thing about our team versus your team, Bill Clinton. I mean, honestly, well, sure, Bill Clinton sure. abused his power over and over and over again. So if, if we want to talk about groping and sexual abuse, let's be nonpartisan. And by I'm the way, for, for every Republican you can name, I can name a Democrat and vice versa. Yeah. That's a nonpartisan problem, folks. But do you believe, so, do you maybe believe? Maybe the audience questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, do you, but I would, but to the point, but in the Republican Party, the argument. Do you want me to come back? I'll something? see you in a minute. <laughs> Why don't you go talk to the history department? Yeah. Um, <laughs> except their thanks. I'd be honored to. <laughs> so, the, so the debate in the Democratic I would argue again, the debate in the Democratic Party is somewhat familiar. The debate in the Republican Party that we're having is one in which the most unconventional person who has ever become president of the United States, and you know far more about this than I do because you, you were in the arena, has taken the most durable tradition of that party, which is Lincoln's right to rise, which is a basic openness uh, to an Adam Smith vision of the economy. A reason I suspect you're a Republican is, I'm guessing, is because you believe that free trade, free trade, the private market, the marketplace should be the first question, not the state. The classic dialectic between Roosevelt, FDR and Reagan, right, which we, I thought we were going to still be in. With the current president, and leaving aside, I mean, we could spend days on that and it would, it would depress everyone. Uh, but it is the case that you have an extraordinary number of people in the right number of states, as you alluded to before, who have so little faith in the institutions as they exist that they were, as you said, willing to send someone. Politicians that they were offered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, sure. A presidential election is not a referenda, it's a choice. Absolutely. Um, I just, what I hear from Republican friends is they're not sure how to get out of this particular cul de sac with this populism, with this kind of Twitter populism, is what worries them. The policy, less so. Yeah. Um... And maybe I'm wrong. No, look, I think, um, I, I don't think it's a secret that I did not want Donald Trump to be the Republican Party's nominee. You're the only person on the stage who ran and, against And uh, I, <laughs> I, I... We had to talk Zeppos out of it. And, and I also think it's not a secret Could that... Some money. <laughs> um, all the way back to the beginning, the trouble with political parties is they will care so much about winning. Sure that they will not care about values or character, or maybe even policies. There are certain aspects of Trump's policies that are traditionally Republican. Deregulation, tax reform, those are traditionally Republican things. And by the way, well, uh, I think- Well, regulating certain things while deregulating other things. Well, that may be. That may be. Yeah. But my, my personal concern with Trump all along was I don't know what his principles are. 
I don't know what his governing values are. Now, I'm not saying this to get a rise out of you, but I also said on the stage a number of times, I don't know what Hillary Clinton's principles are. And in fact, I think in a way, they were two sides of the same coin. <laughs> Say anything to get elected. I, honestly, I think they were two sides of the same coin. I've said this publicly before. I think both of them had an overriding ambition to achieve the position and title of President of the United States. I think both of them were willing to say or do almost anything to get it. I think they were two sides of the same coin because Hillary Clinton sold access and Donald Trump bought access. And yeah. I think that's where we are. Good point. Well, welcome back. Yes, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the Tocqueville in the history department. Um, so let me ask the, this question. Uh, a wonderful question from an audience member. Um, is it more difficult being a woman or a Republican in the technology industry? <laughs> so both are difficult, right? I, I mean, it's, it's not easy to be a woman in technology. It remains an incredibly male-dominated field, and the technology industry should worry a lot about that because it means they're missing half the talent. But they also should worry about the fact that the technology industry is not very diverse in terms of points of view. That's not good either. Um, I, I like to say to um, business people that I advise all the time, look, diversity isn't a nice to do. It's a have to do. It is easier for every single one of us because we're human beings. It is easier for every single one of us to be with people that are like us. Why? Because we all agree with each other, and we can convince ourselves, as people in Silicon Valley often do, that they are better than the average bear, smarter than the average bear. But when you're with people who agree with you all the time and who look just like you and think just like you and talk just like you, you're going to miss something really important. And so it's a shame. Tech Silicon Valley is mm, insulated too often. They are myopic myopic too often because they are still insufficiently diverse in both point of view and in just plain old demography. And by the way, Silicon Valley is also, we have a number of companies in Silicon Valley we as Americans I think should be concerned about this. I've talked about the concentration of power. Facebook, Google, Amazon, there is tremendous concentration of power going on in those three companies, and that is not a good thing. And we need to figure out, I think, how to begin to disperse some of that power. Because I don't care how good you are, how woke you are, or how smart you are. <laughs> power concentrated is power abused over time. She's Brandeis. That's right. It's, uh, you know, it's, you would, think of breaking these companies up or? I think we have to be very thoughtful. But I think for the technology industry to have amassed that kind of power without literally any examination or regulation at all is irresponsible over time. And it simply isn't good enough to say. For, so for example, let's take one that's in the news today. It's absurd that political ads on Facebook aren't subject to the same regulations as political ads on every other medium are subject to. Yeah. Of course they should be. Of course they should be. Do you believe, do you believe that uh, Russia interfered with the election? Of course they did. It's indisputable. It was indisputable a year ago. It's still indisputable. Why do you think, what's your psychological reading of why the president oh, refuses God. to acknowledge I, that? I, you know, I, <laughs> I, look, I, I, agree I with don't you. know. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm I with can't you. see into the guy's brain, but I, my guess is, what many commenters have spoken about, my guess is that he somehow believes that this undercuts the legitimacy of his election. And I, I think it would be helpful, and he won't listen to me, but I think it would be helpful um, for all politicians, but particularly for our president, to realize that a true leader understands it's not about you. 
It's about the people you serve. Well said. After the recent shooting in Florida, um, and due to the student outcry, President Trump today announced a proposed ban on bump stocks. How do you feel about this decision? And then I would kind of add, um, how do you really develop thoughtful policy when you're being so reactive yeah. to a problem that other people might have said, could we at least have three ideas here? Yeah. And well, look, let, let's, let's take the politicians out of it just for a moment. Yeah. Let's just sit here. We're having your conversation. Mm -hmm. I, you can signal with applause or boos or whatever. But I, I think the majority of Americans would say, you know, getting rid of bump stocks is probably a good idea. I think the majority of Americans would probably say, a 17-year-old shouldn't be able to buy an AK-47. I think most Americans would say someone with a history of mental illness and danger to themselves and others shouldn't be able to buy a gun. I think most Americans would agree with that. Here's the other thing I think most Americans would agree with, I hope, is in addition to talking about gun control, which we should, can we talk about how every single institution missed this guy. The local school officials, the local police officials, mental health officials, warning after warning after warning, police call after police call after police call. For heaven's sakes, the guy who clearly has issues, his father dies, his adoptive mother dies, he's living with family friends, he's shooting a gun off in the backyard, how did an entire community miss him? Not once, over and over and over. And we need to talk about that too, mm -hmm. because that's a breakdown in just fundamentals in a community. So it's easy. The problem, I think, the reason I said let's leave politicians out of it is because what immediately happens is polarization and the blame game. So what does Governor Rick Scott do? He immediately calls on the FBI chief to stand down, to resign. Yes, the FBI dropped the ball, but honestly, would it not have been a more leaderly thing to start by saying, we in Florida dropped the ball, and we need to take a look at what we missed? Would that not have been a better place to start? I'm not picking yeah. on Rick Scott. Scott, I'm just using it as an example. Mm -hmm. Immediately, in Washington, D.C., both sides of this debate are starting to raise money. The NRA is raising money mm -hmm. right now, and so are people who want to appeal, uh, repeal the Second Amendment. This problem won't get solved on the extremes mm -hmm. by either the NRA or uh, some people in the Democrat Party who have been on the let's repeal the Second Amendment. It's going to have to be common sense talk among, among Americans, and I honestly think we could find common ground on some of this pretty darn fast. Well, you know, I, I remember Harry Truman had the buck stops here. I think some politicians need the buck stops there with the finger pointing somewhere else yes. because you're right. If, if, the sense of, and particularly when you tie it to your emphasis on community and localism, you know, to, you know, ask questions about who missed this is a question that everyone has to ask, whether it's someone down the street, whether it's someone at the school. And I have no idea what happened here. But to also say, well, those people in Washington, they can solve this seems, I think there are solutions that could come because a lot of the problems that you've discussed may be national policy that need to be undone. But on the other hand, for someone to say, I had this tragedy in my backyard or my state and say, well, maybe someone up there can be blamed. Uh, I think, I think um, on both sides, getting rid of the politicians and talking common sense. And the fascinating it, thing to watch here is going to be, and this is a case study for everything you've said tonight, is will these students who survived, who are becoming active on this issue, 
actually proved to be an inflection point from the broad yeah. base to the top. That's, I, that, to me, that's been one of the most interesting things to watch over the past seven, eight days. And we all hope so. Let, let, me, let me say, not um, in terms of discouraging, but going back to our, sometimes our real power is to have an impact on the things happening right around us, not the things far away. One of the downsides of technology, I think, is it can provide the illusion of action. <laughs> Activity is not a result. So there's nothing wrong with demonstrating and protesting and joining a hashtag movement. There's nothing wrong with that. And if it raises awareness and it begins a conversation and a dialogue and it puts pressure on our public servants to do something, fantastic. But joining a hashtag movement and protesting and demonstrating are not the same as actually making progress. Making progress, actually solving problems, takes a lot more hard work. It's the carpenter building the house. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of glory in it and there's not a lot of drama in it. Um, this is going to take a lot of long, hard work and compromise and collaboration to actually have a result here. That's the story of great American reform, though, isn't it? Because without a broad base of pre-hashtag activism, there would have been no suffrage, there would have been no abolition, there would have been That's no right. civil rights, there would That's have been right. no Reagan Absolutely revolution. right. Absolutely right. It, it's a dialectic. Thing. And those things... Um, involved a lot of people sacrificing a lot over, over many a long decades. period yeah. of time. Unfortunately, right. too yeah. long, sure. too long. Well, I have to close this, and uh, I want to close it by thanking you very much for visiting our campus and enlightening us with this conversation, Carly. Oh, well, what it's a been great fantastic. conversation. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome.